Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I know that this is a late session at a very distant venue in a very distant section of the uh, conference center. So the, the bad news is that we've got a bunch of open seats. The good news is, is that every single one of you that are here, I know that you really, really want to be here. So I'm very encouraged by that. Uh, I'm encouraged that you all have such an interest in modernization. Throughout my career, I've had the opportunity, the benefit of being with several organizations that have gone through their own modernization journey and realize that elite performer status, looking at organizations where you see that they really move fast, they have high agility, they, they really know how to push product and features out. One such company that I was at just before coming to AWS was with an education technology company that focused on student safety. And primarily what we did is build machine learning models to detect threats to students throughout the world. And so we would do data mining with school districts, public, private, military, and try to identify kids that are at risk by looking at emails, uh, documents, anything that the school district had access to. One of the primary sources of that was an online document editor, an online document editing uh, solution made by a company that also gives out free email services. I'm sure you can guess which one. Uh, when we first released this software, it was based on a polling model where we would go and we'd pull these documents down and we'd run them through our ML models to see if there was any threats to students. The problem was we supported tens of millions of students. And if you query that many times with API restrictions, we were running about 72 hours before we could actually process all this student data. The organization that runs the online editor released a new API where they've supported a push model. And we had goals of reducing that overall number. And the DevOps practice that we put in place, our modern data architecture, our adoption of serverless first and microservices allowed us to support that new API uh, push-based model in less than five days. Five days from release until we were running it in production, running thousands of transactions per second, supporting tens of millions of students. So it was a remarkable feat in a very fast time that we were only able to do because of all the hard work that we had previously done to prepare for just that type of opportunity where agility becomes key. And so you're asking, why am I starting this very long story on this conversation? And here's where the kind of personal attestation for me occurred on modernization. Three weeks after we deployed that out, I was meeting with one of the safety supervisors. These are the people who get these alerts on particular students. And they told me the story of a young high school student who had decided that uh, they essentially wanted to unalive themselves and had written a suicide note on the online document editor. Five hours after they wrote that, they had local authorities that were there and they caught the act just in time. They were able to get this young man and high school student the help that he needed and it has a happy ending. They got the help that they needed. They ended up moving on and, and finding resolution to their issues and they were now being seen by the community around them. I'm confident that if we didn't have the ability to deliver that new functionality in that amount of time, it literally would have, have cost a life. So that's my personal experience, and it's very meaningful to me. I ask that you all think to yourself, what would a highly modernized organization with extreme agility provide for your own organization? Think about the art of the possible and make that your North Star, because modernization is something that is incredibly difficult. There's no compression algorithm for experience, we say, and there's no compression for the modernization journey. It takes time. My name is Ryan Peterson. I'm the worldwide technical leader for modernization with AWS. I'll spend the next 30 or 40 minutes or so. The second half of the session, the better half, I'd say, is going to be presented by uh, Ollie East with Baker Tilly, and he'll actually share um, their journey and their results and actually some exciting news of what their own modernization was able uh, to achieve as well. 
Um, looking at the agenda, we're gonna start with the why. Always like to kind of explain why it is we're talking about what we are and why it's important to you and your organization. Um, whoops, didn't quite get to the next one, did I? There we go. Uh, we'll go over the pillars of modernization uh, and building that strategy, and then discuss how you then scale that around the organization, because modernization in isolation uh, is not what we're after here. We wanna actually scale modernization across the organization. And as I said, Ollie will uh, take the stage and, uh, and give the Baker Tilly story. There we go. Um, so starting with, with, with the why. So CIOs say that 80% of developers' time is spent on the operations and maintenance of applications, and only 20% is spent on innovation. That's a startling number, right? We tend to think that builders, developers are out there constantly creating business value for the customers, but the reality is, and this is 2019, I believe, from Deloitte that produced this study, um, this is really not the effect that we're seeing or the actual numbers or metrics that we're seeing. So 80% of the time, these builders, these folks that we think of as innovators and providing value to the company are actually just spending their time keeping the lights on and only 20% actually generating that customer value. And so as CIOs, as leaders within these organizations, these numbers are reversed. They would expect those to be um, just the opposite, right? 80% on innovation. And it's not just a technical problem. This impacts business. So if you think about long release cycles for new product and features, I shared my story about how that could be a life and death situation. And it's not always the case that it is, but it can result in lost revenue, missed opportunity, and a loss of competitive edge for your organization. Organizational uh, inefficiencies uh, and an increase in overhead costs, that can result in lost productivity. It can also result in an inability to hire more resources, more builders, because you're spending that time uh, on, on the operations. And then finally, if you're in a regulated industry, this could result in actual fines to your organization if you're not meeting new compliance requirements or new regulation requirements. So if you're operating within the public sector space, maybe in the financials, et cetera, that oftentimes have many changing and evolving regulatory requirements, uh, you really run a risk of uh, falling onto some fines, but more importantly, um, eroding customer trust. Uh, so if, if you're not able to meet those requirements and it results in an impact to those customers, it can really impact trust, and we all know that that takes a significant amount of time uh, to actually rebuild. So when we talk to customers about this challenge, what they've come to us and they've said is they said, look, we really need to innovate and deliver value. So we want to get to market faster. We want high performance and scalability. We want to have security and uh, isolation by design. And by the way, we want to do all of that at a significant lower total cost of ownership. So it's, it's a tall order for modernization, but all of the incumbents within many industries are competing against startups that are digital natives that are starting off on these modern application architectures, on these modern operating models, using modern teams and are highly agile, right? They don't have the significant tech debt of a lot of those incumbents have. And this is, is where organizations are now needing to, to, to move, not only to compete with all of the existing competitors, but to prepare themselves to compete for those who come next. It helps when you look at a modernization journey to know what success looks like. I oftentimes like to say that modernization has no end state, but it's not very encouraging to think that you're gonna go on a journey that has absolutely no end, right? So you do wanna have kind of an idea of what does success look like when we stop and look around. Um, so looking at some challenges and, and what modern organizations succeed in doing. Uh, so the first is from a, just a pure development release cycle. Uh, so looking at organizations that are releasing software measured in the days or weeks and modern organizations moving into uh, deploying those types of things uh, in, in minutes, able to stand up infrastructure instantly on demand as well as deploying applications in an automated way uh, uh, via CI/CD uh, pipelines. Security, 
usually is something that's ad hoc, that's bolted on after the fact. Looking at modernized organizations, security is actually baked into part of the application architecture. Lack of visibility in applications as opposed to having applications that when deployed provide full visibility into those product teams, not only in a development or a staging environment, but actually in production so that they can be proactive in responding uh, to issues that they're seeing based on production volume. And inconsistent tooling. So organizations that are standardizing on tools and best practices are, are removing the cognitive load of those build teams, of those developers, so that they can move faster and focus on development features. At the business level, some characteristics of those modern digital businesses and what they tend to focus on. First, and this is something you hear a lot about Amazon, it's customer obsession. You'll find that if you look at those organizations that a lot of us look up to from a technical aspect and a success aspect, they really center everything that they do around customer obsession. They're organized around that customer obsession to deliver value for their customers. So organizing their teams, their structures, their funding to be laser focused on delivering that customer value and not spending time on any of that undifferentiated heavy lifting. They develop a test and learn culture. So they, they take experimentation seriously. They test hypotheses out there with their customers and they rapidly iterate and change and adapt to deliver that increased customer value. They always hold technology at the core. So leadership has a strong understanding of technology and what its capabilities are. It doesn't mean that everybody must become a technology company but they certainly must have an understanding of technology capabilities and how it can be utilized as a tool within their industry, within their organization. And finally, it's the strategic use of data. And I mean this in two ways. One, they use metrics to make decisions. So nothing is based on a gut feel, but it's utilizing, generating, and providing metrics so that they can be used to make business decisions as well as technology decisions. Secondly, they use data to generate additional value for their organization and their customer. So generating new features, new products, new value based on data from multiple applications and bringing that together. Now that we have an understanding of what success looks like, let's talk about a strategy to get you all there. I want to start by discussing the pillars of modernization. So a lot of times, and even in this session, you'll find a lot of folks that are focused on the technology aspects. How do I deploy serverless? How do I configure my containers? Do I go with EKS or ECS, et cetera? And those, those are all things that obviously you need to go through, and it's a part of modernization. But modernization itself is based on three pillars. And so if you think about it like a stool, you can't have one and you can't take one out and still have stability of the stool, right? So they go together. An example that I like to use uh, oftentimes is uh, when we're talking about monolith deconstruction, is that if you don't follow across all these three pillars, the only thing worse than a monolith is a distributed monolith based on a bunch of tightly coupled microservices, right? So it's important that you follow all three of these pillars of modernization. I'll go through each one of these, starting with what I consider to be uh, the most important one, and that is people. So people are the drivers of innovation. It's really not the technology. So it's the people, it's the builders, it's the innovation that comes from them that's going to actually generate the value. Just by utilizing the best in breed of technology isn't going to, isn't going to bring you uh, those results and increase the value of the products that you're producing. We went through this ourselves at Amazon back in around 2001. So we were growing rapidly. We were selling you know, books and then more products becoming that everything store that you can read about in, um, in the books themselves. Uh, but we were struggling from a infrastructure perspective. So we started off like many organizations do on the kind of classic three-tier web application model. We had a massive monolithic application and even bigger database. I think it's been the news you heard. We have this very large Oracle database. And the reality was they just didn't make 
a database large enough for us anymore. So we realized that we were struggling under the pressure of our own success. So back in 2001, we decided that we really needed to do some introspection and figure out how we can modernize and take our internal architecture to uh, the next level. Um, we started off with people. And in our experience, we found that organizations that are um, uh, large collated teams, co-located teams, end up with monolithic architectures. And those that are small and distributed end up with modular service architecture. And this is backed up by science and data that long predates our Amazon struggles. So if you haven't heard about it, Conway's Law, which states that an organizational system will inevitably produce an application architecture that matches that organization's communication structure. There's a computer scientist, Ruth Milan, who has a slightly better code, I, I think, that's a little more to the point. And that is that if the architecture of the system and the architecture of the organization are at odds, the architecture of the organization wins every time. So we knew that we wanted to go to this loosely decoupled uh, microservices architecture. Jeff Bezos sent out a memo in 2001 or thereabouts, and it's pretty infamous. You can kind of find it on the web. It's gone through a few iterations, so some of it actually isn't quite true, so it's a bit mythical at this point. Uh, but at its core, it states that, uh, look, we've got problems. We're moving to a new architecture. We will be service-based. Everything will be communicated via API. There will be no accessing of data for other teams. Everything will be communicated through that API. There will absolutely be no backdoors. So it was a very clear point that we are going to create this isolation. Stating in an email wasn't enough. So we embarked on this journey to take this monolithic architecture and this hierarchical organization and move into a decoupled service environment with two pizza teams. So we use two pizza teams a lot, and I imagine most of you probably have heard it, but for the benefit of those that haven't, it essentially is just a fun way of standardizing on a very small number, uh, uh, small um, count of team members, right? So the idea is that your team should never, should never exceed being able to be fed by two pizzas. So if you stay late, you stay late at night working, um, trying to push out that last features. If you got to feed the team, two pizzas should always be enough. The reality is, is it ends up around eight to 10 people. More so than just the size, though, is how you divest control into those teams. And so these two pizza teams own the service. And when I say own the service, I mean absolutely everything about that service. They're the ones that are holding the pagers. And we still do this today. So our service teams, those that are running any, you pick the service that was announced at the keynote. That's ran by a two pizza team. They hold the pager. They're the ones that are responsible for actually operational, providing operational support for that service. They are the decision makers. They own the API. They own the data. They own everything. So they run as these independent startups. And so oftentimes people ask, what is it like working at AWS? Or what's it like working at Amazon? And I say, you know, it's, it's like a thousand startups all under the same roof, somehow all moving towards the same goal and aligned to that goal. And that's what it is. All these two pizza teams, it's amazing how independently they do operate. AWS actually came to exist because of one of these two pizza teams. So Andy Jazzy was one of the uh, you know, early um, creators of AWS, and it came out of this experimentation-focused small two pizza team that then grew into what is now a large cloud provider, $80 billion run rate, and why we're all here today. Next, I want to go into processes. And this is really about automation and self-service. And I like to use the term guardrails, not toll booths. And so when I think about guardrails, I think about highways, right? Highways have very well-defined lanes that are really wide. They have speed limits that everybody knows. They have very clear on-ramps uh, on and off-ramps. They only consist of cars that are designed to go very quickly. But those cars can move independently and autonomously however they want to 
they're on that freeway. But once you're on that freeway, you're moving at fast rates of speed, right? Compare that to when you're on that highway and you hit a toll booth, right? Going along the freeway at 80 miles per hour, do you come up to a toll booth? Or if I'm from Southern California, so if I'm driving back home, it's the agricultural check station, right? Very frustrating to go from 80 down to zero. No one likes that. Similar in software process. If you develop gates to your process, very, very disruptive to innovation, disruptive to speed and agility. So it's really about moving towards a model where you can create guardrails, not toll booths, and enabling your teams to move as quickly as possible. And we've developed over the years about 21 services that we, are, that we call our, uh, our management and governance portfolio. So you have the ability to utilize services like Control Tower to automate account provisioning, taking care of the networking layer, centralized logging, et cetera. Uh, you have the ability to uh, automate compliance and move to a model away from gates and more to detective controls with things like CloudTrail and AWS Config. Automating provision management using CloudFormation and service catalog so your developers can provision services, features, best practices through a self-service model but doing everything under governance so that it's controlled and not the Wild West, and utilizing things uh, like Config, uh, like CloudWatch, to create these guardrails and protections so that you can allow them to move at this fast pace, but do so in a safe and a secure way. Finally, we have technology. Technology, as I stated, is one I think that a lot of folks uh, tend to focus on when they think about modernization. Um, what I mean with technology here, though, is really about building apps and not infrastructure. So there's a reason why we're really strong proponents of serverless, and we're really strong proponents of containers utilizing Fargate. So it moves that line of the shared responsibility up, model up. So your builders, your uh, operations folks are needing to do less of that undifferentiated heavy lifting. And we talk about that a lot from an infrastructure standpoint, right? We talk a lot about moving into uh, EC2 from your data center, not doing the racking and stacking and power and networking, et cetera. This applies to your product teams, though, as well, to those applications, right? If you think about it from the kind of operational load on your teams, I think we're used to talking about the compute side, looking at virtual machines, moving into EC2, eventually containers on Fargate, and then into serverless. So a lot more operational load on the left and less on the right. But this applies to databases, storage, messaging, right? So moving away from self-hosted, databases into RDS, where it removes a lot of the operational burden on managing those databases. And finally, into something like Amazon DynamoDB that automatically scales in a serverless environment globally. Analytics as well. Self-hosted kind of big data type solutions moving into Amazon Glue, EMR, and even Athena. I see a lot of organizations that struggle with the decision, do we self-host or do we use managed services? Now think back to what makes a modern digital business. Right? It's customer obsession. It's organizing those teams that are laser focused on delivering that customer value, which means everybody else around them should be laser focused on removing anything that that team is spending time doing that is not focused on delivering that customer value. We say removing the cognitive load of the team so that they can focus on what matters to the organization and what matters to the customer. So if you're moving rapidly, you're experimenting quickly, you're creating these new environments, these, these new test applications, et cetera, you can't be burdened by those toll booths, by those gates of setting up a new database or requesting some centralized DBA team to do that. Remember, those small teams own everything. They own that data and the operations. They're not going to become database experts. They don't have to be. Utilize those managed services. It's built-in best practices. You automatically get security, backup, et cetera, on many of those. So 
do I go full manage or do I not, should be an easy decision. Now that we understand the three pillars of modernization and the approach, next is how do you take that and actually scale it across the organization. I'm gonna do this in six steps because anything worth doing and anything that's remarkable always takes six steps. If you don't believe me, you can go look it up and trust me, Google it. <laughs> the first thing you wanna do is form a cloud center of excellence or CCOE. So you've heard this term before, I'm sure. One thing that I personally don't like about it is that it tends to kind of give this uh, idea that it's some ivory tower that kind of uh, insists and centralizes from on high. So for today, we're gonna say that this is really your cloud center of enablement, right? So still keeping the acronym so I don't get in trouble. Um, the next thing you're gonna do is look to deliver strategic lighthouse applications. This is where you're really gonna prove to the teams, to the organizations, and to leadership of what's possible. What can we actually do? You're then gonna establish clear vision and support from leadership. A lot of time, modernization, modernization activity and journeys start from bottom up. It's the developers that are, quite frankly, really unhappy with the status quo, and they want something better. They've seen their friends do better over at that new startup across town, right? And quite frankly, they're actually looking to maybe go over there because it looks a lot more fun. And so a lot of times, it's started from the technology aspect from the bottom up, but to be successful, it also has to come from the top down. And so utilizing those lighthouse uh, application examples and using it to get that clear leadership support. Once that's done, it's establishing best practices within the organization. This is how you're going to scale. This is how you're going to find uh, success across the organization. This next point, I think, is one that's often missed, but in my opinion, is, is absolutely a requirement and that is to focus on enablement and community building within your organization. So I always say you need to make sure that everybody within the organization first knows how to cloud and then develop that community so you can develop those best practices around how your organization clouds. But until you have that baseline knowledge and those basic, uh, that basic understanding of how the cloud is much different than how they were operating in the data center, you can't then adapt it to your own type of model, right? Otherwise, you just end up reproducing your existing operating model in the cloud and, and paying a lot more. Finally, on the scaling function, it's moving to a decentralized CCOE. So taking the success that you found within that organization and replicating it around dis different business units, different regions, and keeping that kind of smaller mentality so that you can not become a distributed team, but what we call a decentralized team. So I wanna go through each of those steps in a, little, in a little detail. So the first is forming the team. It's really important to look at the people that you're going to be putting on that, that first team. So just like the, uh, the Avengers of assembling the team was focused on a very broad range of, uh, of, of skills and talents, you need to do so when you put together your CCOE as well. I suggest that you find folks that are extremely focused on experimentation. So they need to be bold and challenging the status quo and not afraid to, to try new things, to step out of their comfort zone, right? Result-oriented, and I mean by this, they need, to, they need to be those that are going to see things through and be dedicated and really focused on the results of the activity that they're going to be uh, embarking on with the team. Customer focused, I feel like it's been said many times already in this session, uh, but it's really key here too. So making sure you're putting a team together that has an interface with the customer and understanding of customer needs so they can have that as input in all of their activity. And then finally, an ability to influence the organization and leadership. So you don't necessarily want just those that you think are most talented on the technology front. You want those that are also able to convince and bring others along with them. When you're looking at those initial applications to use as your lighthouse um, initial modernized applications, you want to cheat the system a little bit. I think that a lot of folks that have come to me that have started this and kind of failed is they decided to take on their, their, their biggest, baddest, most scary kind of 
monolithic application. And they've had challenges with that. They didn't quite yet have their feet underneath them. They didn't quite have the skills that they needed. And they saw a lot of headwinds. And I'll be honest, it pushes them back quite a bit because that, that trust is lost of, is this even capable? So when you're looking at these lighthouse applications, look for high value applications that are relatively small. You don't want them to be one-off. You want them to be representative. And so others within the organization are going to recognize the modernization motion that you're showing them. They're going to recognize the results. They'll see where it was before, and they'll see where it was after. And for that reason, you need to also make sure that it's measurable. So I mentioned that your organization needs to be really uh, uh, data focused. And this, is, this, is, uh, this applies here as well. So make sure that the Lighthouse application is going to be measurable. So take your metrics before and metrics after so you can show success. And there's some standards on metrics that you should be using. So some would be like frequency of deployments. That's a great metric for modernization. So a lot of times that is kind of a leading indicator of success that you have in automation of your pipeline in your test. That one combined with um, uh, t uh, time from commit to production. So how long does it take a commit of your code base to actually get into production of the application? So these are the door of four if you're, if you're keeping track. So there's a several metrics that you can use uh, to show success of that application. Iterate with every pilot. Modernization is about iterative improvement. You're not going to get it right first. Start small, show results, iterate, create that flywheel and then push it into best practices. So you always want to standardize on reusable patterns and continuously build that community, share those patterns, put them into things like service catalog, put them into your code base where you have infrastructure as code, CloudFormation, Terraform, whatever you use, make it accessible and self-service and always document uh, those lessons learned. When you go and get leadership support, make sure that you're defining that vision and strategy across the organization. And be really aggressive with your goal setting. You're going to be able to perform and do a lot more than what you think. Once you find your modernization legs and you start to develop these best practices and they're applied quickly to a lot of these organizations, you're going to achieve some pretty remarkable results. So think big, be aggressive. And then make sure that the mandate of move to cloud architectures is organization-wide. You don't want to fall into the problem where you're so laser focused on modernizing existing applications that you're continuing to do new applications the old way. So you want to make sure that you're developing not only an understanding of modernization from a movement of your existing applications, but also how do you think cloud? How do you adopt a serverless first mentality? How do you uh, continuously push for modern application architectures. When you're establishing the operational principles and uh, guardrails, um, a few kind of categories that you want to be focused on. So security should be across the board, across the organization. And a lot of times you'll hear us say that you, you shouldn't centralize things, but this is one thing that, that tends to be more centralized, which is security best practices. So this is typically some, a lot of times what we call a complex subsystem team or a centralized team. We have a centralized security team here uh, at AWS for all of our uh, services as well. Um, observability, monitoring, and logging. This is a difficult thing to get right. So this is something that very early out of the gate, you want to establish best practices on how you make sure that every application that you're deploying, that you're modernizing, is observable to all of those that are uh, involved. Architectural patterns, these are going to be different when you move to loosely coupled distributed architectures. So there's some well-known and documented um, architectures that you can use as a baseline, but develop your own, document them, evangelize them through your organization, and make sure that the teams, those two pizza teams, are standardizing on those architectures. And I'm not saying centralized. Don't force them on it. Create value for those teams. I like to say that you in, encourage use through seduction. So you want those teams to so want to use those services, those application best practices, because it's going to actually save them a significant amount of time. That's how you achieve standardization, not through force. 
And finally, streamlining through modernization pathways. So these pathways are what we use internally within our engagements with customers. We found that when customers embark on a modernization journey, a lot of times they run into a couple of key headwinds. One is analysis paralysis. We're familiar with that one, right? How do you constantly try to look at this application? Where do I get started? I have to somehow figure out the absolute complete target state architecture before I could even begin. The second is decision fatigue. So you'll probably hear many, many people up here say, we have over 200 services at AWS and thousands of features. And it's true, we have more than anybody else. It's fantastic. It's also incredibly daunting to look at that eye chart of services and where do I even start? What do I use? So by streamlining into these modernization pathways, we found that we can vastly accelerate a customer's modernization journey. So what we did is we looked at data from customers' modernization activity over the last several years and developed a Pareto model of 20% of the modernization motions that represent 80% of the end state workloads. And so we moved them into these six modernization pathways. Moved cloud native is about monolith decomposition. So breaking that monolith into those uh, loosely coupled microservices. Move to container is about operational efficiency, portability, and consistent environment through the use of containers. Move to manage database is moving away from self-hosted relational and then beyond relational by in an introduction to key value and purpose-built databases. Move to open source is about removing the tax on innovation with expensive licensing. So you can experiment more and move faster without having the restriction of uh, incredibly expensive licensing. Move to modern analytics is introduction and move and a movement to a data lake mentality. To move from transactional reporting into a data lake where you can focus on analytics and decouple the analytics and the value from data away from the transactional application. And then the final one is more foundational and that's move to manage DevOps, introduction to test-driven design, CICD automation, and an underlying development culture that sits atop all of these different modernization efforts that without it, you just will never achieve that level of agility that everybody is, is after. So that is what we're doing with customers, but I think it's more valuable to hear from an actual customer who has gone through this with AWS and achieved some results that I'm actually excited to hear because I, I, did, I do understand that there's actually a, an announcement that you have as well with something that happened recently with your organization based on a modernization journey that, uh, that they've been underway for, for a bit of time. So welcome to the stage, Ollie. Thanks. Hey, how's everyone doing? I know we're uh, getting up to the end of the day. So again, like Ryan said, I appreciate you spending the time with us. I'm gonna move this down a little bit because it's a little bit loud. So, my name's Ollie East. Uh, I'm a partner here at Baker Tilly. Um, I've been working in technology so move this again, uh, since I left college in 2005 now. Um, I'm really in the cloud for the last 10 years, right? And it's been great to see the maturity, right? We're looking at a lot of the services that, that Ryan has shown in both the cloud and AWS in general and how people are using these, right? So what I'm gonna do today is introduce Baker Tilly, um, as our firm, what we do, and then go through the challenge, right? What do we look at when we were looking to modernize? And then really the results, right? And not just from a we did this quick or all this faster, but from an organizational perspective, like what was the value that was really driven? So Baker Tilly, uh, about a billion and a half now in, in revenue. Um, Baker Tilly US is part of Baker Tilly International, so one of the largest professional services and accounting firms in the world. Uh, we have roughly 6,500 people split between uh, advisory, accounting, uh, and consulting. So we have about 1,400 people now in consulting that sit from uh, digital services to healthcare consulting to global forensics and analysis. Not something I actually knew was a thing until I came to Piccadilly was global forensics analysis in, in some of this world, but we all learn new things. 
So looking at our digital services, we, we kind of have these five pillars. Right? So first is our transformational strategy team. Right? So this is the people element that Ryan was talking about. This is the processes. This is how do you make sure that the technology you put in is adopted, right? that it is driving that value that was sold. Our cloud services and data solutions team, we both work from a strategy perspective. We say, there's lots of things you could do in the cloud. What should you do in the cloud? But we also go through to implementation as well. And then finally, enterprise solutions and application services. This is where our large enterprise um, ERP system sits, uh, team sits. So think Oracle, Dell Tech, uh, IFS, and Sage Intact. And it's actually the Sage Intact uh, product that I'm going to go through today. So what was our challenge? Well, back in October 21, Baker Tilly actually acquired Sage Intact Partner of the Year Act 2. Uh, and with that came around 200 applications, which were built to sit on top of Sage Intact. Right? So think automation services, think other kind of modular services, um, integrations and things like that that customers use to interact with, with the Sage product. Now, while that's great, the problem is, is they were all on premise. So the challenge we had is one, it was kind of very hard to scale in line with the growth. Two, it was taking far too long to implement product for clients, right? And Ryan talked about being cloud native, right? If you think now the competition, the people that are cloud native, they're much more nimble, right? So we're finding that our competitors can actually deliver these products and get people into the to Sage ecosystem quicker. And two is, in, uh, sorry, three is innovation. Right, customers are just driving the need for us to continuously innovate. And unless we have the ability to do that, we're falling behind. So what caused the, as we call it, the great stall? Like why, why wasn't this problem addressed? Right, everyone knew it was, was an issue. Right, they knew what needed to be done, but, but what was stopping it? So first, skills and experience. Right? So a lot of the people that came with the acquisition had been working on uh, on-premise infrastructure for 20 years. Right? It's what they knew. So now moving to the serverless of this world, right? now moving to some of the AWS services, which you know, quite frankly come out very often. Right? They're, all, they're all pretty, uh, pretty new compar comparing sorry, to some of the old systems we work with. You know, we just didn't have the skills and experience. Secondly, it's a pretty niche product, right? So these applications like, are built for each customer. Right? There's some standardization, of course, but they are built for each customer. Thirdly, and I think this is one of the last things where I mentioned is stakeholder alignment. And I don't mean in respect of we need to do this. It's that analysis paralysis, right? It's that I'm attacking the big problem, and we have to analyze every single way of doing it. Right, so you keep getting in this perpetual cycle of, well, if we do this, well, I don't know. Maybe that will work. Maybe it won't. What about the cost? And it just stores everything. And last is time, right? Like, you know, I'm sure you've heard the saying, what gets measured gets done. Well, if you don't allocate time to do this, and the time of your developers and your engineering team, I think you know, Ryan's stats was like 80% is, is on maintenance rather than innovation, is they just don't have the time to do it. Right? So you can start to see just from these four pieces like why this wasn't getting addressed. So what did we do? So when the acquisition was final, my team came in and we knew we needed a catalyst. Right? We knew we needed to start something. As Ryan said, you start something small, you get your lighthouse. So first off, we decided, hey, let's work with AWS on one of their new um, uh, initiatives, if you will, called the EBA, right? Experience-Based Acceleration. So what that does is it actually brings together the AWS expertise in a very focused way. I'll go on to a bit more about that in a second. But the very first thing is, is the sponsorship, right? It's that top-down leadership that Ryan had mentioned. 
But we also needed to know or needed to do was make sure we understood what the role of that leadership group was. We had a program sponsorship group. And that group's role was to support the EBA team, remove blockers, right? It was not to make the decisions. And that was key. Second, we had to identify the right work stream leads, right? We talked about this concept of two pizza teams. So we had to identify who were the two pizza teams that were gonna be working across this uh, goal of moving one application to the cloud. So when we originally went through with the sponsorship group, we also set those metrics with Amazon, with our leadership team to say, what do we want to achieve? And that was it. We just want to move one application. If we can do that, that's success. So the process started off uh, a few um, uh, working sessions with Amazon to understand, hey, what do we have today? What are we looking to achieve? How could we get there, right? Using things like Lambda, Fargate, different types of, of modernization services that, that Ryan had mentioned, we came up with the actual design, right? Then we actually all got together um, at our offices in Houston for three days. So we brought everyone together to learn, right, to experiment to implement, to move that one application. And that was it. At the end of the three days, we were going to move that application. That was the goal. So what had taken weeks of even discussion previously or months of inaction, we were going to try and do something in three days. So, so what did we do? Well, we managed it. At the end of the three days, and they, they were hard three days, I'm not going to lie, we actually managed to deploy that application to the cloud, the first one. So what had taken, again, almost years at this point of discussion was done in the three-day session plus the workshops before. So we're talking end-to-end, -end, maybe five weeks. And now we have that application running in a modern architecture in the cloud. So what were the outcomes? And I've kind of split this up into to two. So I wanted to start with the organizational outcomes first. So the very first one here I have is momentum, right? So the EBA is a fantastic experience, but it isn't a magic, uh, a magic, but a silver bullet, right? It's a catalyst, it's a start. It gets people thinking about modernization rather than just migration. Now, when we talked to the team when we started this, we were very much in the lens of, we need to migrate an application. Now the team's thinking about not just migration, but how do we modernize? Right? How do we make this better? And how do we start then scaling this out to the other 199 applications that, that we have? Second, there is continued learning, right? Like, again, everything that was done in the EBA was great. We proved it out, but it wasn't perfect. Right? So as we started migrating more applications, we started learning more. Right? We started implementing different ways, different services, right? creating the design patterns, creating the security understanding, <coughs> pardon me, right? creating the assets we needed as we grew. The other is future thinking, and I touched on this a minute ago around thinking around modernization, not migration. But now we have been driving this new culture of modernization, right? Thinking about new products and trying them, right? Again, Amazon releases, I mean, 200 products, over 200 products now. Some are very new, you, you just gotta try it. Like, so we now have this culture of, hey, I don't know if this is gonna work, but, but let's give it a go. And then lastly, the organizational changes, right? So we have a, uh, CCOE um, as well. But now we're using that CCOE to evangelize this thinking and this culture, right? To go across the business and start to take not only the patterns and the processes that we have in this acquisition and this set of applications, but how do we start to permeate that through everything else that we're doing? Right? Again, it's a culture. It's getting the, honestly, the right people on board, but it's, it's, it's getting to people understand the value internally. 
So what has that driven for us? Well, we actually recently won, actually recently about three, four weeks ago, the largest Sage Intact implementation that, that's been awarded. And I don't want to say all, because you know, we have a fantastic team, but a lot of that was down to our ability to implement in a time frame that was aligned with the customer needs. Right? Think about that. Three days or five weeks in a three-day session, better thinking, assets, and we've just won a large contract. But in general, what we're seeing is, uh, and when Ryan first saw this, he said, is that 90%? I was like, no, it's 90 times faster. Right? What we used to have to deploy in a week, using things like cloud formation templates, we're deploying in end-to-end -end probably 30, 40 minutes. Right? Just think about the difference in time in these, uh, you know, new modern CI CD processes that we have now. Right? We can prototype, right? We're starting to deliver more innovative solutions. Because we're building that culture of, hey, I'm just gonna test it. I don't know if it works, but I'm gonna give it a go. Right? And that's driving innovation. From a security perspective, you know, that's one of Ryan's big pillars. Well, you know, we now have no servers in these tools. It's completely serverless. So it's not just the security, it's the maintenance. We have cloud for, um, a control tower. Everything is centrally managed. I mentioned before, we've implemented new DevOps procedures, right? So we're more streamlined, we're faster, right? more nimble, more agile. And the other thing that, that is a kind of output of this is, honestly, build the happiness is much higher than it was before we started this. Right, you gotta think about that. These people wanna work in this new modern infrastructure on this new stack. Like, people are excited about this. You know, as Baker Tilly, we wanna retain and, and uh, you know, bring in top digital talent. Oh. They wanna work in this kind of culture with this kind of technology. And then the last one, the cost. Right, so again, no server management, no server costs, it's eradicated. Right, we're reducing operational costs by at least 50%, even when we're scaling. So the benefits that we have seen as an organization, this is just the tip of the iceberg as the, as, as the uh, product from the actual actually grows out. So thank you for listening to Ryan and I today. It, I, I love the story and I love hearing it from, from the audience. If you're, you know, I was curious because Ollie, if, if, I'm, if I'm correct, I think you've actually internalized the success you've had with modernization accelerator powered by uh, EBA internally. You're actually reproducing and doing this with, can, with more workloads internally. Is that right? We, we are, yes. So again, you know, this is just one part of, of our business, right? Of what we saw as, as the group. So we're internalizing this and pushing us out, not just actually in the US, but outside in the Baker Tilly International Network. So we're able to share and grow across the globe with this, rather than just in the US. That's been really impressive for us. Great story. Thank you so much, Ali.